Today's episode of Distant Replay takes us back to true crime. We're talking about a baseball player who was at the top of the game in 1968, but five years later was out completely at age 29 years old. There's a lot of speculation about how it happened, why it happened, but what we do know is that Denny McLean was a MVP, Cy Young, and a 30-game winner, but his career abruptly came to an end in 1973. We'll tell you that story today on Distant Replay. This is Distant Replay. Well, our focus now is on Denny McLean, the former Major League Baseball pitcher. Not just any pitcher, too. Really a star pitcher for a little bit of time in the 60s, but a short career because a lot of stuff that happened off the field. And we're going to talk about the debt, and we're going to talk about that today on Distant Replay. So, Mike, why did you pick Denny McLean today? So this was another uh, listener suggestion in the comments. Uh, I'm glad they suggested it. We got, we got this from more than one person. Um, and I had known Denny McLean and, his, and how good he was as a pitcher. I had known that he had gotten into some trouble. But, man, when you peel back the layers of what he was involved in both during his career and after his career, this is one of those that, again, just the sheer length of time that he was involved in shady stuff is just mesmerizing. So this dude has a reputation. Uh, yes, to say the <laughs> if, least. If we had a couple of people send it in to us, um, must be a pretty good story. So we'll tell you that today. Again, you can find us online, distantreplaypodcast.com, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube as well. Leave those comments. We're listening to them. You got a, got a show idea? We'll follow through. Mike loves doing the research, going down the rabbit hole, and sharing it today. So let's start. Denny McLean, some background on him first. All right. So Denny McLean uh, grew up in Illinois in a suburb right outside Chicago. He attended high school in Chicago, in the city of Chicago. He, he was signed by the White Sox as an amateur f free agent out of high school in 1962. So then, Ben, like you got like territorial rights to certain players if they were within your territory. Okay. So he was from like a south suburb of Chicago. So the White Sox had the option to sign him. So they did in 1962. He was acquired by the Tigers off waivers in 1963. I looked into a little bit about how that happened. Mm -hmm. And this is a crazy rule back then, Ben. Players who had one year of minor league service were able to be picked up on waivers by other teams if they were not on the MLB roster. Whoa. So I think that the rosters were expanded back then, I think. But if you didn't designate someone on that major league roster, you could just pick people up off waivers, sort of like another draft. Dude, could you imagine that now with the way that they delay the, the clock on a lot of these young kids? Wild. <laughs> that yeah. would change what the game. What a crazy rule, right? From there, he rocketed up the Tigers farm system, okay? Between 1963 and 1965, he sort of ping-ponged between the minors and the majors. He started some games for the Tigers. He came out of relief for the Tigers. But in every stint he was in the pros, he, he pitched very well. But still a, a relatively young pitcher. Remember, he just came out of high school in 1962. His first full major league season was 1966. He was the all-star game starter, and he won 20 games. So a really good pitcher. Yes, really good young pitcher for the Tigers, who are an ascending team at this point, a good major league team. In 1967, he has 17 wins in the month of August. So again, on his way to another great season. He has an injury happen where he seriously injures two toes, and they're asked, like, hey, what happened? He says like his foot fell asleep and he stubbed his toes somehow, right? Aww. That's the story he gave as far as why he hurt his toes. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that incident later. But because of that injury, he missed a couple big starts down the stretch. Uh, he lost the last game of the 67 season, and the Tigers ended up missing the playoffs by one game to the Red Sox that year, wow. right? So that's 67. Now, the next season, 1968, would become what Denny McLean is known for to this day in terms of his pitching. He won 30 games in 1968. 30 games? That's he actually that? won 30. He actually won 31. He finished the year 31 oh and God. 6. 31 and 6. <laughs> First pitcher since 1934 to do it, and he's the only pitcher since to do it. Okay? He wins the Cy Young, the MVP, and the Tigers won the World Series. So think about this, Ben. I mean, back then, baseball is it. Yeah. Right, baseball is the nat is the national pastime. It's it's the most popular sport in America at that time, 
and you have a guy who wins the Cy Young, the MVP, and wins a World Series. And wins 30 games. Wins 31 <laughs> games in a, in a baseball crazy town. Yeah. I mean, Detroit still to this day, big baseball town. So he's like the biggest athlete in the country. May, I mean, probably I don't know if you can say world, maybe. I don't yeah, know. probably in that moment he is. You yeah. know, um, He's on the cover of magazines. He's a big TV star. He's making all endorsement money, like a lot of uh, popular baseball players did back in the day on local commercials, you know what I mean, for local car dealerships, stuff like that. But by 1973, Ben, he's completely out of baseball. Hmm. So at a young age, five years after this 30 games, all the accolades I just mentioned, he's completely out of baseball. So by 73, that puts him, that makes him 29 years old. That's it. So he's gone out of baseball at 29. Out of baseball at 29. And the rest of the episode here, we're going to get into what path he went down to lead to that to happening and beyond. So 30-game winner at the peak of the biggest sport in the country, baseball, having won an MVP, having won multiple Cy Youngs, World Series champ, five years out of the game. So I'm very curious to see how this all unfolds. Okay. So by all accounts, the beginning of the end for McLean happened in February of 1970. So we're in the off season, right before, you know, spring training starts. SI comes out with an article titled Downfall of a Hero, okay, of which McLean is the subject. The article details all of his off-field issues, okay, chief among them and most concerning to major league teams or the major league as a whole, major league baseball as a whole, is he has ties to an illegal bookmaking operation that he invested in that was based in Flint, Michigan. And he started his involvement with this illegal bookmaking operation in 1967. So we're talking this predates his, his great 1968 season. Now, he's not a bookie, right? But he's like sort of bankrolling the operation and, and, and involved with it from a higher level. Yeah. So there's bookies that work under him, okay? And, and, and the organization that he's involved in. Now, the bombshell that came from this article was that there was a guy named Edward Voshin who was a noted gambler, and he won a huge bet on a horse race to the tune of like $46,000. Okay. And the bookie he placed this bet with was one of McLean's bookies. Now, I'm not sure why the bookie would take a bet he couldn't pay out, but he did, okay? The bookie failed to pay Voshin. Voshin has some very... Uh, say dangerous, influential friends, however you want to put it. One of those is an organized crime figure named Tony Giacalone. Oh, what a great, name. What great, a name. Great, great name. <laughs> uh, just great name. He sends, Voshin sends Giacalone to collect on his behalf. And they figure, well, we have Denny McLean involved with this bookmaking operation. We'll go to him because he's the one of all these, of all these people involved in this operation who could pay us. He's going to be the one who could pay us. Now, the Sports Illustrated article claimed that that meeting with Giacalone is how McLean ended up with the hurt toes late in the 67 season. Hmm. So Giacalone goes to McLean, says, hey, look, where is, you know, where is Voshin's money? One thing leads to another. It leads to, you know, two broken toes for Denny McLean. Now, McLean denies that that happened, but SI says it did happen. That seems more logical than stubbing your toes because you're tired. Let me yeah, I'll, it I'll because <laughs> it was actually it was he said he stubbed his toes because his feet his foot fell asleep. Okay, <laughs> which is either way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so obviously anything dealing with gambling and a player, never mind if it's of McLean's magnitude at the time, catches the attention of the major league offices. Okay, in response to that article and the allegations and their own investigation, on April first, nineteen seventy, they suspend McLean for three months. Now, if you ask me, based on Major League Baseball sort of reputation on how they handle gamblers, that's a pretty light, light sentence, if you will. Yeah, it seems like it. Because they cleared him on their own investigation. They cleared him of really being as involved with the, with the bookmaking operation as maybe the article alleged. And that he, they never had any evidence of him betting on baseball or betting on his team or anything like, like that. Okay? But with that said, these three months away from the game – was basically the beginning of the end for McLean as, as a baseball player. With no income coming in for, for these three months, as we mentioned, his, his uh, suspension was four. He, was, he had to file for bankruptcy. At the time, he was making, if you remember, like the case with Arch Schleister, remember we did his episode? Oh, yeah. It was sort of the same thing. When the money stopped coming in, 
basically his debt started to amount where he couldn't pay them off. He couldn't make payments. This happened to even a more degree with McLean. At the time, he's making 150000 a year, he said. But he owed 86 creditors $446,000. 86 creditors? Which led to him, you know, filing for the bankruptcy. I don't even, I didn't, I couldn't find a list of the creditors, but 86 creditors means basically anyone you could possibly ever owe money to in your life, pretty much. I was going to say, I'm trying to think back over my life. And if I've done business with 86 different entities, like at, at least <laughs> in, a, in a sense where I would, I would need to, to like spend enough to where I would need to owe money. I'm not talking about a, you know, fast food transaction, but anything like kind of significant. I don't even know that I have, man. That's that's nuts. And even to follow it after three months, that's got to be a huge red flag. Like you can't, you don't have enough money as a professional baseball player. Sure, they don't make the salaries they make now, but you don't have enough money as a professional baseball player that you can't stand to live for three months without a paycheck. Yeah, exactly. Major red flag. And it was safe to say of those eighty-six creditors, I'm imagining not all of them are on the level. <laughs> yeah, he probably owed money to some people uh, that were less than savory. How many Tony Giacalonis are there out there? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you love that name. So it is a great name, though. Now, he comes back that season. By all accounts, like he lost his fastball, both literally and figuratively at this point. He's 3-5 and five and 14 starts for the Tigers the rest of that season. He also had other suspensions in that season, one for dumping ice water on reporters. Okay. So sort of like a uh, Deion Sanders, Tim McCarver moment just with ice water. Yeah. And the other for carrying a gun onto a commercial airline flight. That wasn't legal back then? It was not. <laughs> it was not. It was a, that, that, that law has sort of stayed, okay. stayed steady throughout the years, apparently. <laughs> that offseason, he's traded to the Washington Senators. And the only thing I know about the Washington Senators is that they were terrible all the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He, they're a terrible team. He leads the league with 22 losses. Yeah. He goes from being on top of the world in 1968, winning 31 games, to in 1971, losing 22 games on a terrible team. Just an astonishing fall from grace. That is remarkable. That is, that is quite the opposite end of the spectrum. And he would, you know, he would try to kick around and try to make comebacks, but nothing ever came of it. In 70, by 73, like I said, he's completely out of baseball. And then his post-career starts. One thing to remember, Ben, about uh, Denny McLean was this guy tried to make money any way you could possibly imagine. Okay. And to speak to that, here's some of the post-career ventures he was involved in. All right, let's go. He, he had a business venture where he opened up walk-in medical clinics. Okay. Now, I don't know if they were common back then. But if they weren't, he was sort of ahead of his time with that. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're everywhere now. He was a regular at Atlantic City Casinos. He was still doing being a pitch man for local businesses in Michigan, you know, because he still had a big name, right? This is not that soon after, you know, him, him being a very good pitcher. He was hustling people playing golf. He would play the organ at bars for money. As if those aren't wide ranging enough. One thing he was also alleged of doing, which blew my mind, was he was paid $160,000 by ca via cash in a suitcase to smuggle a criminal out of the country who was facing criminal charges. <laughs> wow. They said he flew him out of the country. Now, I don't know if that means he, I, I'm assuming that means he was not flying the plane. Not literally in the cockpit. Yeah, yeah but somehow involved with that whole scheme. Now, this all leads to, in 1984, he was indicted on charges of racketeering, cocaine trafficking, and extortion. And he's actually sentenced to 23 years uh, for these crimes. Okay, wow. L lengthy sentence. Okay, but the, the case ends up being thrown out on procedural grounds. So whatever procedure was supposed to be followed by the prosecution was not followed, and he ends up getting off and not going to jail for 23 years. He kicks around, still involved in a lot of the different money-making schemes that I outlined before, until the early 90s, him and some partners buy a meatpacking plant, okay, which ends up going bankrupt within a couple of years. Shock to you, I know, Ben. Denny <laughs> McLean, not a great meatpacking meat plant business <laughs> operator, okay? 
But what stems from that is what he would go to prison for for six years. He was charged with others for embezzling money from that meatpacking plant's pension fund. Oh, wow. Okay. He goes to jail for six years because of that. Now, that was that's the only prison sentence he would serve that I could find of all the things he was involved in that were illegal from uh, the bookmaking operation to the the $160,000 for smuggling someone out of the country to all to the racketeering, cocaine trafficking and extortion charges that he was sentenced to 23 years for. The only prison time he ends up serving when all set and done for everything he does is the six years for this embezzling money from the pension fund. Okay. okay. So now he gets out and he's still sort of in the news and, and relevant. He's hosting different radio shows. He's writing books. You can imagine the books he wrote and the stories he told in those books must have been fascinating. Yeah. Given like, you know, some of the things I've already outlined here in this episode, along with things that we probably didn't even know about. So still very active. You know, if you want to hear from Denny McLean, you can find him, you know. Since then, he's been arrested twice in 2008, 2008 and 2011 for outstanding warrants. Okay. None of which for like really serious crimes, but still, you know, different warrants from around the country for random stuff, you know, not appearing for court appearances, things of that nature. Yeah. One other funny story I found is the 2011, when he was arrested in 2011 for his outstanding warrants, it was that he got arrested at the border of U.S. and Canada. And essentially what happened was when you go to the border, if they, if they, you know, they take your name and they run it through a database to make sure you don't have any outstanding warrants before you leave the country. So when they ran his name, they saw he had outstanding warrants and he got arrested. Well, the story is, is that he was in Michigan and essentially took a wrong turn on a highway and ended up on a bridge that led him to the Canadian border. So he takes <laughs> a wrong turn, ends up at the border Jeez. and gets arrested for the outstanding warrants. Man. So I just thought that was a pretty funny story. That's crazy. Um, yeah. He has, he actually, I mentioned he has, he had radio shows over the years, wrote books. Um, and he actually hosts a host a podcast. Oh. Huh. It's called No Filter Sports. It's still an active podcast. From what I could tell, the last episode was published in the beginning of February. Shock, it tends to, it seems like it revolves around gambling, hmm. uh, which I guess I shouldn't be surprised by. Another thing interesting I found in my research is that, do you remember the show Beyond the Glory on Fox? Yeah. He was a subject of a Beyond the Glory episode and he actually appeared in it, you know, okay. talking about yeah. his life story. So that is the story of Denny McLean. I just thought from where he started in 1968 to him going the wrong way and getting arrested on an outstanding warrant in 2011 at the Canadian border, just everything that happened in between then, just an insane story that I thought was worth an episode here on the podcast. Definitely is. Pretty wild story. And I'll have to check out that podcast, uh, see what he's all about. Uh, I did go, I did kind of look up him and one of the first stories I found, I don't know if you found this, Detroit Free Press, he actually held an estate cell last, in September of 2020. I guess his wife died recently from, I think she had Parkinson's at some point. He's actually had a pretty troubled life outside. Like he's obviously I, brought a lot of stuff on his own. Yep. No, I did read that. I did, had, I did read some stuff about his personal life. And, and yeah, if you want, if you want to, if you want to go into some of that. Yeah, I was gonna say like his wife dying, so that's why he had the estate sale. But you know, in the course of that, like reading about him, you know, his he had a daughter that died, that was killed by a drunk driver back in the '90s, which is just horrible. So he's he's definitely dealt with some things. But I was looking at this estate sale because it went up in September of 2020, as I just said. But yeah, you go through this, and if you just Google it, you can find like the pictures because the estate sale listing still online, dude. I just quickly kind of looked through some of his collection of sports memorabilia, just like the baseball bats and the autographs. And the hockey sticks and the hats and the balls, like it is like any baseball fan, like it would be a, a kind of a mini museum, uh, the stuff that he had. So I can't imagine like how much all that stuff went for. They're actually charging people to go into his house to have advanced tickets to get access to it. That's how big of a deal it was. It was like 200 to $400 tickets just to get into the state sale. But like, just like the Ted Williams and Mickey Mantle, just think about the era that he played in. Right. And like the yeah. legends that he was around. I mean, God, to have access to that, it's pretty crazy. Yep, up until 2020, Denny McLean's doing whatever he can to make a buck. Yeah, 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 pretty crazy. Yeah, you know, yeah. 
a wild story, but man, just thanks for sending it our way. Um, we appreciate the recommendation. If you have one, send it to us. We will put it on our list of shows. We got plenty more true crime. We got full games. We still got on the list. We're actually we're doing more documentary recaps as well. So a lot in the hopper right now, and uh, we look forward to sending that your way here soon enough, Mike. So thanks for taking us through this story. Crazy, crazy career. Denny McLean, the only 30-game winner since he did it back in 1968. That is incredible. And uh, wow, what a history. Yep, Tony Giacalone. You'll never forget that name. Until next time.